Everything that I have done has just been a continuation of the groundwork laid for me in, in providing me a strong base with farmers and strong values. So this is basically my, uh, the people who led me to where I am and who built the foundation for this business. On the right in the back was the um, owner from 1935 to 1947, and he bought the factory from his father-in-law. And then Ferdy, he ended up owning the cheese factory from 1947 to 1989. But this shows you what 42 years of owning a cheese factory will do to a person. The, this is a picture of Ferdy in 89 when he sold the factory to me. And then um, Dan Hetzel, whose picture is down below, but he worked here for at least 54 years and was really the main person who taught me what I know about about the art of cheese making. If you seek to know the heart of the heart of Wisconsin's great cheese tradition, Cedar Grove Cheese in Plain, Wisconsin would be a terrific place to start. Home cooks and chefs have known for generations that Wisconsin's cheese is second to none, but its innovation has, for the last 30 years, been shepherded by Bob Wills of Cedar Grove Cheese. He's a master cheesemaker, he's an innovator, he's a mentor, He's an icon that's keeping this great Wisconsin tradition of exceptional cheese alive for generations to come. Hey, Bob Wills. Hey, Kyle. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming. Well, it's good to see you. And it's uh, plain Wisconsin is an oxymoron. It's far more than plain. Used to be, uh, used to be a high density of cheesemakers. Yeah, there were uh, at one point 22 cheese factories within about seven miles of here. Um, we were the first of those and we're the last of those. Just in the 30 years that I've been here, we've lost a lot of the farms and we've uh, seen a lot of the cheese factories go away and we're doing our part to try to maintain the, uh, the tradition here. One of the reasons why this is a cheese factory that survived and some haven't is because um, we see ourselves as being um, innovative and mm -hmm. flexible and creative. And so I'll take you out in the plant, show you around, and we'll come back and... We'll have a little cheese tasting. Yep. Or, or maybe a lot of cheese tasting in my case. You know, there's a lot of cheese. You're welcome to, <laughs> welcome to try them. I mean, when in Rome. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, warm, milky smelling room. <laughs> so. Uh, I know you measure milk by pounds when it gets to this point. So yep. how many pounds of milk are in this vat? So this is about 15,000 pounds of milk. Okay. And, and, and the big one will hold 22,000 pounds, and this one's about 15 or 16. And this has got, those are curds. Yep. That much I know. What I don't know is why this is so white, looks like the milk that I pour out of uh, the jug for my kids. Yep. Uh, and why is that more of a yellow here? Most of the cows are still out on pasture. They've that, concentrated the, the um, beta carotene from the grass into the color of the curds. This part of the season, we're starting to get more whiteness to the cheese, uh -huh. but there's still quite a bit of butter fat. So when you see the curds at the end, they're, they, they look pretty yellow compared to the color of the milk coming in. When I got in the business, nobody worried about what the cows were eating. And when you're dealing with grass, grass is changing all the time. So we started making the summer, winter, spring, and fall cheeses because the milk was so different during those different seasons. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've also tried to work with our farmers, um, encouraging them to, go, to get into organic production, whether taking care of their soil or even the um, recombinant provine growth hormone first came on the market. You know, we immediately went out and asked our farmers, do you guys have any interest in this? You know, is this anything? And they didn't want to work with it. So they didn't want to be injecting their cows. And my customers preferred not to have that. And so we were the first factory in the country to promise not to use milk from treated cows. No offense, but this little factory with its 30 partner farms created a trend that changed the way the dairy was made and sold in cheese. One of the things that has caused a lot of the small plants to disappear is the inability to make those jumps. And so mm -hmm. when pasteurization came in, that was a big expense for factories. And the most recent one, when the wastewater treatment became a bigger issue, we made the investment to try to keep us on, on track for that as well. So when you make cheese, you've got a lot of water. And at the end, that water's got to go somewhere. Well, let me show you the living machine. And that, that would be really cool. It, it's easier to show than to tell. Oh, cool! 
Yeah, so you know, this is a whole ecosystem. The dirty water comes in here, and then it flows from tank to tank, it has oxygen added, and then the wastewater microbes that eat all the nutrients out of the water. This is gross. This is, yeah. I didn't expect it to be this brown looking. There's no sense, it's really. Part, no, it's partly that it's dirty water because it's, you know, it's cleaned everything. That's good brown. It's good brown, it's from yeah. the microbes, yeah. yeah. You know, and then as you then as you get down around the corner, we've got we have this giant fig tree which isn't growing in the water, but is growing in soil that we made from the microbes. I mean, this may be the biggest fig tree I've ever seen growing in Wisconsin. It has a lot of figs on it. It has we, a lot of figs. We really on don't know what to do with them all. So if send you need, them to me. If you need some for your dinner tonight, you're welcome to take figs with you. Yeah, you happily. So with each tank, it's just purifying, 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 yep. purifying. In this one, so much clean. In this one, the microbes have su are sinking down to the bottom, and then clear water flows over. So the last two tanks are just clean water. I mean, this is legit clean water. And so it goes down in the lagoon now. We try to get as much as possible absorbed back into the groundwater, but whatever's left from there flows down to the creek and ends up in New Orleans. And meanwhile, you're growing tomatoes and figs. Right. <laughs> and a fish. It's a bluegill. Bluegill. And why do you have it? Why do you have one token mascot fish? Well, he's kind of like the canary in the coal mine. OK. If the water isn't clean enough for that fish, we know we have problems. So after the tour of seeing what you've built, Bob, uh, I know bluegill's not on the menu, but there's some cheese to taste back. Yeah, let's, uh, let's head back to the store. I mean, I, I can't be the only one who's hungry. All right. Yeah, this counter has got some of our, our more regular styles of cheeses, but again, there's still a pretty wide variety of things we make here. Yeah, there's a few. Mozzarella, Swiss, Havarti, Colby, my wife's favorite, Buttercas, <laughs> Firecracker Cheddar with Sriracha and Habanero. Now, thank you. <laughs> uh, so if I were going to pick out two cheeses out of here, uh, which two would they be from your, from your classic cooler? And which two would they be from your creative cooler? I'm always proud of the grass-based cheeses because I think that they're, they give a sense of location. That's yeah. Good. Terroir, um, we can use the word. Yeah, yeah. we could, except it's French. <laughs> <laughs> These the, here, the, okay. The, the green label. So a good sharp cheddar. And, yeah, and, um, and then butter case was a, one of the things I'm a master cheesemaker for. So what of the creative cooler would be your two picks, Bob? You know, we have some mixed milk cow and sheep cheeses, the Farco and the Montague. You, you might notice there's a pattern here where we're stealing a lot of our names from Shakespeare. Because we're just up the road from, um, from American Players Theater. Sure. And oh, so, that's nice. So some of this stuff is out of Macbeth and some of it's out of Romeo and Juliet. And uh, then we have some of our water buffalo cheeses. The aged water buffalo cheddar is about three years old now. Mm -hmm. And it aged completely differently than like a cow cheddar would. So, but but you taste that water buffalo. Um, well, don't put it back. Stuff. I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, you take that. Yeah, yeah. So we should start with the butter case because it's the mildest of any of these cheeses. All right, don't, don't have to okay. twist my arm. It's truly buttery. Has a little sharp kind of salt thing. Yeah. Almost turns into a lemon flavor. Right, it's a little citric. That's really nice. And, um, cheese makers, of course, like to play with their cheese. Um, so in order to get it up to temperature, <laughs> um, and release all the flavor compounds and stuff. We'll, we'll, so we'll, I should be doing the Play-Doh we'll thing? <laughs> this is a premium, a prairie premium sharp cheddar. Because of, of it being a grass-based cheese, the, um, it's a little bit softer texture. Even though this is a sharp cheddar, yeah, this, is, this, this like opens up. It's got it has, a, it has a complexity. I mean, you can mm -hmm. almost imagine like this time of year, the grass is getting a little bit brittle. But I love October cheese. So you're really proud of this, I would be too. Okay, I'm gonna have my last tomato, Sounds and good. then we're gonna go for aged uh, water buffalo cheddar. It's literally a cheese, once we eat it all up and you sell it, you can't get it anymore. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, well. I'm still hopeful. Maybe that farmer will see your TV show and realize that he needs to do this for the good of mankind. So that has got aspects of the Buffalo mozzarella. And then sort of a, a, a little bit more earthiness. This has been so cool. Thank you for uh, all the innovations. Thank you for everybody you've mentored. Thank you for making great cheese and keeping this heritage alive. 
we're having fun and learning and hopefully teaching a few things. And you know, and when I'm gone from here, like that will be my legacy as much as anything I do here. We've been working for years now with small cheesemakers who don't have their own access to a facility who are um, you know, continuing to win awards and invent things and amaze me with what they come up with. These guys didn't ask me to come in and consult with them about innovation of their product, but they're creative and they're open-minded and very generous with their time and their energy to say, oh yeah, that's like a weird idea, it's interesting, let's give it a try. All right, let's see if we can get, up, get you across here without getting the camera hit. How's it going? Hey, hey John. Pretty excited about uh, checking out the Colby. I knew that Colby was uh, kind of uh, the first cheese to be invented in Wisconsin and developed here, and I wanted to try to like somehow innovate a new cheese out of Colby. And um, actually, I just walked in off the street here uh, in February, and I met Bob. I, you know, I, I said I had a cheese idea. He said, "What is it?" And I told him to do a double cream version of. Colby and he was like, uh, yeah, we could do it, it's, it's doable. And that's uh, what we're tasting today. Well, it's awesome. It's super mild like, um, like the typical Colby, but well, it definitely it has, has a lot like, of buttery flavor yeah, to it. Yeah, it definitely has like a, yeah. creamy, yeah, a creamy buttery flavor. And I, and I can't wait to see how it pairs with your beer. My career kind of started through getting great pleasure from seeing things. That actually at a young age evolved into more conceptual artwork and a lot of the uh, art that I'm really interested in, it's idea first. And then it uses basically different other forms, whatever form comes naturally or whatever form best supports the ideas. So uh, food was a natural um, evolution from there. And for me, uh, growing up in Milwaukee, there weren't like a ton of models for me of like what an artist could be. John is um, of Milwaukee. He seems like this, this artist who has a presence far beyond Milwaukee, but is very devoted to what's going on here. And his work is more of, I think, a platform for involving other artists in his work and collaborating with, with non-artists or, or uh, cheesemakers, beer, beer brewers, and raising funds to support other people, which I think is very interesting. As I'm getting more attention regionally for my art, I wanted to be able to show the next generation that you know there's expansive ideas of what art can actually look like. And so as you walk into Innova, none of the art of mine will be on the walls. It'll just be in the, the spaces that are normally dedicated to the infrastructure of the gallery that we take for granted. Uh, maybe a cheese plate and some beers that are typically offered at a, a, an opening reception. So there's a, a little bit of an irony here is that um, there's, a, there's a sign on between this lobby area and the gallery that says no food or drinking allowed in the gallery. And there's a, there isn't really a clause about if the food or drink is actually art, that it, it can go through. It can't. <laughs> the cheese tray, uh, by design, it's kind of uh, in the shadows in a way, and uh, people are tasting the double cream Colby for the first time ever, so. So remember, extra rich, extra buttery. Beer elements, it's pretty layered. When I started the Green Gallery um, 11 years ago, I brewed all my own beer for the openings, but as the gallery kind of got more established, um, I was able to try to brainstorm ways of brewing with other brewers. The beer endowment is Georgia Company Brewing It and I, we, we were designing and producing beer and a percentage of all the sales go towards um, these artist-run organizations. The three original beer endowment beers are the Green Gallery IPA. Um, the Poor Farm Pilsner is 
based on an artist-run Kunsthalle-style space in central Wisconsin. There's another beer called the Friends of Blue Dress Park Mild Porter. So all these beers are beers that we're trying to make taste incredible. Because without making great beer, you know, we can't expect to have a great endowment. <laughs> this, is a, this is a pretty good series. People drinking at the bar over a nice pint of um, Poor Farm Pilsner. That's good. Uh, so I'm going to actually finish packing the rest of the truck uh, with my art show and then uh, take off in the early morning for New York. This will be my second solo show with Marlboro Chelsea. And they're based in New York, and um, it's called Group Show, a solo show by John Riepenhoff. There's a lot of work that looks like it's made by a lot of different artists. I made all the work myself, but um, the ideas for the art were inspired by other artists that I've worked with and that have impressed upon me. But a big part of that show, I'll also be giving away uh, Every Bean Chili, which is a new chili that I developed. And uh, there's every known edible bean that I could find. Uh, there's 104 beans in it. And then there'll also be a double cream Colby, which will be both a topping on every bean chili. And also um, people will be able to taste it on the side as uh, just a sample of the flavor of the cheese itself. Wisconsin makes the best cheese. I like the little logo and the little funny name. That's a cheese cream with a little bit of oh, personality. Uh -huh. There'll also be beer that uh, Company Brewing uh, made for the beer endowment. So this will be kind of the New York debut of these beers. Good to see you. Yeah, hey, we're uh, sampling the uh, beer endowment. Is, is the beer an artwork or is the is the beer an artwork or is the is the transaction an artwork? We are trying to have the beer itself represent like conceptually the structure of these artist run organizations. You know, like how each tap handle has been an opportunity to like engage with an artist. And this actually is part of the, the concept of this artist run organization is that it takes something that we normally don't even look at, like asphalt, and it's transforming it into to some other use for our world. And also to get put money into the hands of these artist run organizations, which nobody else is doing, you know, it's like it's pretty radical. So in some ways, like a Midwester bringing out chili and beer and cheese to New York is kind of a, maybe a cliched stereotype. But I, I think a lot weirder stuff that's been done. There's been a lot of artists that have used food as a way to talk about place and culture and community. So I, I think that um, they're going to think it tastes really great and it's kind of an experiment. What you, what's your feeling about cans? Because like, I see that craft brew now, it's coming yeah. in cans a lot. I really like them. They stay colder. They That's seem to like, keep the beer fresher. I mean, we're trying to make really quality beers, but I mean, ideally, we want to go into cans. We, I'd love it to be as as large a distribution as possible. So this is the advent of a project. I mean, this is like this is the infancy of a project, and and ideally, you know, this is this could be a populist thing, and you know, it's a way of thinking about supporting culture. Over this course of the winter, I, I really wanted to go into full production and um, distribute the beer to different restaurants and bars, and also galleries and um, museums. So the beer kind of exists both in a place that's just purely about drinking beer, and also promotes these kind of obscure art spaces. Really nice looking can. First canned beer we've ever had in the company. Let's put that one right there for drinking later. So you can put that here outside. Let's go to the poor farm. And I'll pass them out. Last year's we always brought kegs up there, so this, this is more camping friendly. The idea that actually 
beer can be art isn't necessarily a new idea, but what's really unique about it, partially about the relationship uh, with company brewing, is that the beer itself um, can be you know, a supporting mechanism for art.